Welcome to the Exponential Australia Church Leaders Podcast. Well, hello and welcome again to another episode of our Exponential Australia Church Leaders Podcast. Uh, We have loved as we continue to have a series of wonderful conversations with all range of Aussie and global church leaders, those who are on the ground planting churches and also those who have recognised voices that can spur and encourage us on as the Australian church when it comes to all that the Lord might want to do in Australia in this time. And today we are delighted to be joined by Sam Chan. Um, Sam has become a very recognised voice in the Australian church, particularly when it comes to evangelism and opportunities for Christians to share of the good news of Jesus Christ And of course, we recognise that evangelism and church planting are so intricately connected. And so, Sam, we are absolutely delighted that you'd be with us here today, mate. Oh, thank you so much for having me here, Charlie. Ah, pleasure. Hey, Sam, maybe for those who um, aren't familiar with some of your work and who you are and where you fit in, would you just tell us a bit of your story, a snapshot of your life, what you've done in the past, where you find yourself today in serving in God's church? Sure. Yeah. So I was born in Hong Kong. My parents moved to Australia when I was just a baby. When I was six months old, we spent two years in Darwin, six years in Adelaide, rest of my life in Sydney. And if you know Sydney well, I began in the outer western suburbs, Campbelltown, Lumia, Minnow, ended up at med school at Sydney University, worked as a doctor for about four years in the western suburbs. So Westmead, Blacktown, Mount Druitt, And then I ended up in ministry. So I taught, well, I did a PhD in Chicago along the way. Then I ended up in ministry, taught for about nine years at Sydney Missionary and Bible College on preaching and evangelism and theology. And the last, say, seven, eight years was Sydney Bible Forum in very frontline evangelism ministry with workers all over Australia. So I guess I am where I am now because of a combination of factors. When I was growing up, Uh, My parents were Christians and they were very keen evangelists. And I remember my heartbeat as a young child was always, do they know Jesus? Do they know Jesus? Mum and dad, they don't know Jesus. You need to tell them about Jesus. And I watched my parents have this twofold ministry. One, they will reach out to the neighbours by inviting them over for dinner. And bit by bit, they will get to know the neighbours and eventually have Bible, Jesus, gospel conversations, invite them along to church. And a few neighbours actually would become Christians. So I saw that ministry. Then I saw my parents had an international ministry with university students in Adelaide. They would invite especially Asian, Malaysian sort of students with the Overseas Christian Fellowship, it was called. And they would have them over for lunch after church on a Sunday. So I saw my parents operating at both levels with international university students, also with... um, Yeah, local neighbours. That's incredible, Sam. I I can't quite believe that you've been able to fit in all that you have into your life. Right. (laughs) Um, Sam, obviously I mentioned before that you are the the author of several books, um, namely in the area of evangelism, which um, for some in this cultural moment almost feels like, particularly in, in the emerging generations, that evangelism has become a bit of a dirty word. Uh, But some of the books that you've written are called Evangelism in in a Skeptical World, How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy. And we know particularly on behalf of Exponential, as I mentioned before, that the church planting and evangelism are just so hand in hand when it comes to looking at the book of Acts and the epistles and, and even just like the way that the gospel has historically spread. I wonder, um, if you would be able to shed some light, I guess, on some of the the larger trends that you are observing when it comes to churches and people being empowered to share their faith. We recognize that particularly the last two years with the pandemic and obviously before the pandemic, but there is, it seems particularly in Australia to be an unearthing of a preparedness for people to talk about spiritual things. And, um, and, and what have you been able to witness as, as people in churches, whether lay people, um, employed ministers of the gospel, like what are some of the things that you're observing when it comes to a preparedness to do that? Yeah, there's definitely been a, you know, cultural shift in the air. We all sense that. So my own evangelism journey is when I taught at Sydney Missionary and Bible College, I was teaching, preaching, 
a theology, but not evangelism. But there was a guru called John Chapman who, who was teaching evangelism, but then he decided to retire. I remember the principal asking me to take over and I said, no, I cannot be a John Chapman. No one can be John Chapman. But a few days later, John Chapman just came storming into my office, dumped his portfolio on my desk and said, brother, you are teaching evangelism. And I thought, wow, I now have to come up with 45 hours of material from scratch. I looked at John Chapman's material. It was illegible. But at the same time, you suddenly realize, you know, we are in a different cultural moment. So maybe this is a chance to be a blank slate, not that we can ever be a blank slate. And I thought, well, I'm in a missionary college right now. How would missionaries evangelize Australia uh, from scratch? And so I employed a lot of those missiology principles to evangelizing Australia. Also, the, the shifts that have happened have been so well explained by other great thinkers. So I remember Rico Tice explaining we have gone through three moments of evangelism in recent Western history. The first moment was the Billy Graham phase where Billy Graham is really telling you what you've heard before. The audience was, the audience were non-believers, but they were churched non-believers. They came on church buses. So Billy's basically, basically saying, hey, come on, you've heard this before. Don't you think it's time to believe? Come on, come down the front, believe. But then the next phase was, you know, the last 20 or 30 years, what Tim Keller calls the, the defeater belief phase where people know what Christians believe, but they have defeater beliefs. They can't believe what Christians believe. It could be the problem of science, the problem of other religions. I can't trust the Bible. So then we just had to remove those defeater beliefs and then people would believe. And Tim Keller's reason for God is an example of that. But now we're in the most recent third phase of evangelism, and that's where people don't know what we believe. Mm -hmm. They don't care what we believe. And deep down, they worry that what we believe is wrong, hateful, and bigoted. So now we actually have to promote belief. We have to woo them mm -hmm. to want to hear what Christians do believe. And I think Tim Keller's most recent book, Making Sense of God, is an example of that sort of, sort of evangelism. Tim Keller's also said we've gone through three phases of evangelism. We've had pre-Christendom. That's the early church in the Roman Empire. We've had Christendom where we've had cultural Christianity and that's had its own problems. Yeah. But now we're in post-Christendom. We've come out of Christendom where people are post-churched, post-reached, post-Christian, and that's got it, its own set of problems. And whatever worked well in pre-Christendom, won't necessarily work in post-Christendom because in pre-Christendom, they really were a blank slate. They didn't know what we believed. So we could simply do acts of charity. Like we all talk about how the Christians stayed behind during the pandemic and that really promoted belief. But we noticed in post-Christendom that didn't work. And so we have examples of um, the, 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 oh, who are they? The, the, some, let's call them the Samaritans. They try to set up a makeshift hospital in New York's Central Park during the pandemic. And they were chased out because of their Christian beliefs. Wow. So we're in a very different phase of evangelism. Also, I think Richard Borgenon, who promotes the use of the word one-to-one, -one, he talks about how evangelism used to be where we try to funnel people to church. Mm. And that was, you know, you know, churches would put on a big event, like a carol's night or some, you know, I don't know, Easter event. And our job was to invite them to church and people would become Christians. But now we are at the front line. The church is no longer the front line. And we as Christians, Monday to Friday, that is, that is where we're the front line. And we're, we're the funnel now. We're the beginning and the end of the funnel, whether we like it or not. Wow. And so like putting some, some, some meat on those bones, like what have you been able to see in churches that have been able to effectively equip and empower people to be able to actually be that front line like what are yeah. some of the, the trends or the dynamics you know is it, is it good training is it um you know an, an increased heart for the gospel like you know speak to that a bit sam wow i think so much has changed because we've all sensed the change i think maybe 20 or 30 years ago at the risk of stereotyping um but i will then you know That's we right. had a maybe a, a very thin understanding of what Christians were meant to do Monday to Friday at work. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, we had a, maybe a very low view of work. Really, you work basically to make money to give to missions. You work basically so you can invite your non-Christian friends at work to church. Yeah. They were probably the only two reasons people, Christians work. Now we realize, wow, we need to have a higher view of work. Like work doesn't just pay the bills. Work isn't just there to give money to missions. Work isn't just there to invite friends to church. Work is where I have to be Jesus at work. I have to be light of the world, salt of the earth. I have to have, and, and I have to image God, the creator uh, at work. So I'm, I'm actually creating, I'm God at work, at work. You know, I'm, I'm creating beauty, logic, order. And I'm also his means of bringing justice, mercy, and love into the workplace. So we had to have a higher view of work. And I think we've also suddenly realized Christians have to do some sort of personal evangelism as well. Whereas in the past, evangelism really was event-based. And I love event-based evangelism. Like at City Bible Forum, I do a lot of that. I am that speaker at the event you invite your friends to. So I'm not saying it's an either or, it's a both and. But evangelism used to be church event-based. You know, Carol's Night, a gingerbread making night, an Easter event. But now I realize it's a both and we need personal evangelists out there Monday to Friday in the front line in the workplace. Amazing, Sam. That's so great. I, I wonder as, as you've been able to observe the, the, the shift and the change within some of those trends that you've been able to talk about and recognizing the need for the church to be much more around empowering everyday punters when it comes to God at work, sharing their faith. Um, and realizing perhaps there's a whole bunch that the church has to unlearn in some of those spaces in order to really see disciple making and evangelism prioritized within our churches. Um, what have been some of the, I guess, the barriers that you have observed then for believers in doing that? Is it, is it, a, is it a fear? Is it a sense of feeling ill-equipped? Um, it could be a range of things, but like, what have you seen as, you know, significant blockers to people being able to share their faith? Definitely the feeling of being ill-equipped. And I think up until now, when we train Christians to be evangelists, we had two good models, mm. two good models. One was the, um, how to invite them to a church event model, which yeah. is good. And then where a speaker like me gives a 20 minute monologue Bible talk. We had another model, which was how to talk to a stranger on a university campus, maybe pull out a tract and have a quick three to five minute conversation about Jesus. And they're both good models. But now I realize most Christians need a third model. What do I do with friends and family that I see every day where yeah. there's not a 20 minute monologue? There's not a three to five minute make or break conversation with someone that I never see again. What do I do with friends and family that I see over and over again? Yeah. And so with City Bible Forum, we, we've sensed this trend where people like me get invited to churches a lot to equip Christians to do what to do in this middle space. And it really is how to talk about Jesus through a conversation yeah. rather than a monologue or a track that you pull out of your pocket, which again, you monologue how to do it through a conversation, right. how to evangelize, not like a preacher, but like what I say, a counselor. Because when you see a counselor, what does a counselor do? They actually ask questions. They get you to do all the talking. Yeah. And then they get you to discover the answer for yourself. And it's almost a way of promoting a new way of looking things, at things through asking questions and getting the other person to do all the talking out aloud. I think uh, that's where I love to equip Christians on. You can do this. You just need to be a calm, non-anxious presence, wow. be the de facto chaplain in the workplace, wow. the person they come to times of crisis, the person who understands, who yeah. asks good questions and who really, really listens. I love that, Sam. So I, I, I want to repeat that again because I think it's very significant that, that Christians would be a non-anxious presence, that they would be good listeners, that they would ask questions and, and be that kind of, as you mentioned, de facto counsellor. I just think that's a, a beautiful picture of what the church can help to empower within the life of the body throughout the week. Um, and I wonder if you would go a bit further, Sam, to even um, elaborate on 
want, you know, if, if, a, if a Christian were to find themselves in that situation, I've heard you speak at a number of events where you kind of, and I'm sure you'll be able to correct me as I get this wrong, but how Christians are able to resonate with, with somebody. And I think you then go on to talk about dissonance um, and, and that being a way by which um, Christians are able to engage with someone where they're at, resonate with where they're coming from, dissonate with maybe where the gospel can, can you elaborate on that for me, Sam? Because I think I'm doing a bad job. Oh, you're doing an excellent job, better than <laughs> what I can. So now I'm the guy who's going to ruin what you've been saying. Yeah, so we, we have to resonate. We have to show we're the one who understands. I remember Craig Springer from Alpha USA saying, and he quoted someone else, but I'm going to quote Craig Springer as a, yeah. as a source. He says, home is where you're understood. Mm -hmm. So we can be the home away from home for people uh, by the person who asks the right questions, who show we understand, who resonates, who we nod our heads along and we go, yes, 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 yes. What you say is true. What you say is good. What you say is beautiful. But there has to be the moment where we act as a sort of pebble in the shoe, mm -hmm. where we dissonate, where we say, oh, ha, huh. move them to an ha. Huh a heart moment, like, oh, I have a problem. I have something missing. I have something that clashes. Uh, oh, I thought I had all the answers. So in education theory, they say everyone thinks they have a full glass of water. So you can't give them anything more. You can't give them more water because they say, hey, I have a full glass of water. So we have to show them, yes, you have a full glass of water. That's where we resonate with what they're saying. But at some stage, we have to empty their glass of water. So that's where we dissonate. We empty their glass and now we say, hey, let me fill your glass. So right. after we've shown the deficiency or the dissonance in what they believe, we can show them, hey, you, you actually need Jesus. We show how Jesus is the answer to the questions that they're asking. So I'll give you an example. I was just speaking at a crew ski camp for teenagers last week, and they believe very much in equality, freedom, human rights. And where we can say, yes, I agree to equality is important. Fairness is important. Human rights are important. But where do we get these from? Mm. Like if we're just atoms and molecules, there's no such thing as freedom. We're just another species of life on this planet. There's no such thing as fairness. And what, what are human rights? Like show me a molecule of human rights. This is where I quote their authors at them. So I love quoting Yuval Noah Harari, the author of Homo sapiens, Homo Deus. He's a secular atheist philosopher. And he too agrees. Yes, you are right. There, there are no such thing as human rights. Yeah. They're just a useful fictional story we've been telling ourselves. Useful, they help us get along. Fictional, they're just an artificial construct. Really, they don't exist. Get over it. And then you say, well, if you really want to believe in human rights, you need to believe in a God, a creator who creates us in his image. And that's where we get equality, fairness, and human rights. Mm. Another example would be to say, we're all looking for purpose. We're all looking for meaning. We're all looking for the ultimate story. But hang on, you know, if if this universe is just atoms and molecules, we're just an event. There is no story. Uh, get over it. We can pretend there's a story, but really we're just a blip in the timeline of the universe. For there to be a story, there, there has to be a, a God with his story and we can be part of his story. So then we can have direction, purpose and meaning. But without a creator, without a story, really things just happen. They're just events. Get over it. Um, you know, we didn't have to be here uh, and we won't be here in, in, a, in a blink of an eye. Wow. And, and where I heard you then go on and also, and I think this is a challenge for every believer, is actually from that place then um, obviously pointing them towards Jesus. Yeah. And what many of us can do is actually instead point them to our, our version of Jesus rather than what the, the gospel actually is. And, 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 Many of us, rather than pointing to Jesus, can talk to, to my version of Christianity or to somebody else's version of Christianity. But what does it mean, uh, like you talked about before, as a missiologist to actually within their context to point them to the person and work of Jesus? Yeah, that's right. And it's um, it's and the challenge is you don't have the 20 minute monologue like you do in a 
Bible talk at a church and events. You don't have the track they can just read out from, you know, in a three minute conversation. You're doing this through just little nibbles, mm. uh, little trickle down conversations, little snippets of conversations at work, Monday to Friday, or with your neighbor when you see them on the front lawn. And I think for me, it's really done through questions like, oh, why do you ask? Well, what do you think it means? Why do you ask? What do you think it means? Because if you come in with your version, that's you haven't emptied their glass yet. You know, yeah, they're, they're actually not listening and they're not hearing what you say. And more and more now, I realize even if I tell them about Jesus, they're not really listening. Mm. This way, I really do have to take them to the Bible. I think we're so post-churched. Mm. Uh, we, we just have to get them reading the Bible for themselves. Yeah. And I think think it's word one-to-one who said that 20% of your friends or Aussies will say yes to reading the Bible with you. Wow. It's, it's higher, maybe 40% during the pandemic. Wow. And it's obviously higher if you've built up enough social capital with, with your friends. Mm. And I think that's become my go-to move now. Not saying there's any silver bullet. No. There's no drop the mic moment. There is no magic meme. Like I, often we thought evangelism is where I can have a drop the mic, silver bullet, magical meme moment. It's not. It's done through just little trickle down, little snippets of conversations. But more and more now, my wife and I are uh, just saying, hey, would you like to read the Bible with me? And it just seems to work. Wow. Whereas, you know, in the past it would be, hey, do you want to, you know, I, I, I won't, mention anything because i'm not trying to diss anything but i think now we're post christendom uh somehow you i think this is the game changer just saying hey would you like to read the bible with me that's amazing sam and i know particularly given the census data that but you know at the time of recording this podcast and when uh, whenever we release this uh, many would have access to know that um what it presented was that, um, and, and beg your pardon, I'm referring to the NCLS data here rather than the census data, that 50% of, of people outside of the church are unsure of the, 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 the person and work of Jesus. And so therefore, as you say, that the best way that the church can kind of probably correct some of its PR issues is actually around bringing people to what does the word of God say about Jesus. And, and rather than necessarily even, you know, of course, when we celebrate, we, we love the gatherings in churches. But to even be able to do that, as you say, in a one-to-one relational, conversational question um, format, I, I would hazard a guess at being a, a real opportunity for, for Aussies in the future. Definitely. Um, Craig Springer, Alpha USA, he, he was quoting the st- uh, the Barna research, Barna research, which is like McCrindle research in Australia, but it's Barna in the USA, that the average non-believer would prefer to hear about Jesus from their friend. Wow. So again, they, they don't mind hearing about it at a church event or reading around in a book. They don't mind that. But if, they, if there was a preference, they would prefer to hear it from their friend. And I think that's right. I think when people say no to religion, as they just have done in the census, mm. they're saying no to cultural Christianity. Yeah. They're saying no to the institution they imagine. Yeah. Uh, but they're not saying no to talking about religion with their Christian friend. I think also what they've discovered in research is people have a problem with Christianity as an idea in yeah. the, the abstract notion of Christianity but they don't have a problem with a Christian friend in their life. That's why when people find out you're a Christian, they don't stop talking to you. They keep talking to you because they don't have a problem with their friend being a Christian. They might have a problem with Christianity, but they don't have a problem with you, the friend, being a Christian. And that means if they're going to hear about Jesus, their preference is to hear it from you rather than through the institution. Wow. Sam, I think that's um, a great segue to, you know, recognising that a lot of our listeners on this podcast um, will be in, you know, church leadership or roles um, within the leadership of churches or considering what planting could look like in the future for them, um, envisioning, you know, what it means to take a a next step by way of multiplication in God's church. And I guess um, one of our final questions that I would have for you today would be around 
Um, how could a church leader really begin, and I emphasize begin, to kind of create that kind of culture within their church where people might capture something of a vision of, hey, you know, really my week starts on Monday. It's, it's, it is my worship when I go to work and sense the opportunities that might be before me by way of um, relationship and, and identifying God being at work and, and being able to have those kind of conversations that you've talked about today. If you were to kind of paint a bit of a, a broad sketch of how a church leader might be able to create something of that culture within the life of their church, where would you start or what would you suggest? There's no one size fits all. There's no one tool to put in the toolbox. But what's worked for me in God's providence, so this won't work for other people if that's not how God is working in their lives. I've ended up being bivocational. Mm -hmm. So that means I work one or two days a week in so-called secular work as a doctor and the rest of the week in so-called sacred work in ministry at Christian uh, City Bible Forum. But that's really equipped me. I, I think if you can, I'm not saying you, most people can, but if you can buy vocational work where you have stories then to tell at church on Sunday about what happened to you on Monday and Tuesday at work. Wow. And then also because you're in ministry at work, gospel conversations always come up. Yeah. And then because you've been in so-called secular work, you got so-called secular work stories to tell at ministry on a Sunday. So I think that's really equipped me and it's put it on the radar. What the, and just what the cultural vibe is out there. Like every year it changes. Like, do you remember like 10 years ago, you know, it was all about arguments against uh, what, what to talk about the problem of science because of Dawkins. I mean, that's, that's so 10 years ago now. Right. And then, um, you know, two or three years ago, it was, a lot of to do with the um, marriage debates. Let's so like five years ago now, and, and then this year it's Roe versus Wade. Yeah. So, but if you're not working at on Monday to Tuesday, you, you you're lagging behind on what's happening uh, at the front line, the coal face, I think. So that's one thing I would throw out there. If you can, in the providence of God, and I know most people can't try to find some sort of bivocational ministry, uh, but the other thing then is just realize our, our, our job on a Sunday then isn't to run the massive event, you know, and I think in the past when it was that attractional event based model, pastors would end up being burnt out because your Sunday had to be the mother of all events. And then next Sunday, you think, how are we going to repeat what we just did last Sunday? Oh my gosh. We, you know, so it was almost unsustainable. So it's almost a relief that, now in post Christendom, we, we need a different sort of model. So maybe really seeing, and I'm learning so much of this from Mark Sayers, mm. uh, that church now is an apprenticeship model. Mm. I, I, I am actually discipling disciples to be apprentices in like Jesus, to be Jesus uh, in their workplace Monday to Friday. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Sam. And it feels like in this season, and I think the, you know, I, I don't like to go on about it because I think it was always there, but even with the pandemic, it's just revealed a whole bunch of a need for the church to revisit its metrics on what does success look like? What are, what are the opportunities that are before us as the church? As we realize that there are 90% of Australians who aren't going to darken the door of a church unless we actually um, consider the opportunities that are before us as everyday men and women to, to be on mission together uh, for the sake of the good news of Jesus. Um, Sam, I love, and I, I often ask this question to, to guests that we have on our podcast, um, is particularly around your hopes for the future of the church, you know, like as someone who has had a broad range of experiences, is passionate about evangelism, um, is very well read and, and, and written, um, what, what are your hopes for the Aussie church to, that is in this unique season going forward? Wow. And, and it is a unique season. I, and I don't know how much, whether you give me one minute or, or <laughs> 10 minutes, but somehow, well, again, to go back to the discipling um, model that we're there to, to, to grow uh, disciples, apprentices, of, of Jesus and then they have 
and that they can be a light or salt wherever they are. Mm. Um, and the Aussie landscape has changed so much. Um, oh, so oh, I don't even know where you want to get me. Hey, go for it. Handballing here. <laughs> oh. So I, I don't know. I, I'm just brainstorming. So uh, the original, oh, no, no, this will open too many cans of words. <laughs> I think we've had to stop it there. It's over for another, uh, another podcast. But I, I, I like how John Dixon often puts it. Like, you know, if if the post office went missing, we would miss it. If the local butcher shop went missing, we would miss it. Uh, what would people miss if suddenly the church went missing? Wow. That's, that's a great thought to, to finish up on today, Sam, and maybe that's given us a good excuse to, to find another time in the future to continue that conversation because that is what we, on behalf of Exponential Australia, are definitely praying and hoping to stir the church towards as we do consider the enormous amount of opportunities that are before us for evangelism, for church planting, for multiplication, however that looks. And so, Sam, we're so glad you've been able to join us today, mate. You've been an absolute gift. And I want to um, encourage any of our listeners who haven't already got their hands on any of Sam's books to read those if that is something has really grabbed you today. Um, but thank you so much for being with us today, Sam. Oh, it's been awesome. Thanks for having me, Charlie. Bless you, Sam. Thanks for listening. For more great resources, please head to our website at exponential.org.au.